AI is part of a bigger picture that I've been talking about here for a couple years, and that is a bunch of new technologies that are coming along all at once that will change our world in many significant ways. And as I've mentioned the last couple of years here, this comes on the heels of another re uh, revolution that happened about, started about 20 years ago that I spent a good deal of my career and many of you have spent a good deal of your careers dealing with. So I'd like to just go back and start with that. If you went back to the 1990s, especially from the early 90s, and were giving a presentation like that, these are the transitions that I was talking about uh, back then. Uh, the big transition from physical movement to the movement of uh, using telecommunications to move things. Instead of sending an overnight letter to uh, get uh, some testimony or, or uh, a report to a client, uh, we would use fax instead and later an email attachment. Uh, just example, example of changing, has come about changing physical movement to communications. The change from analog to digital. Back in the early 90s, just about everything was analog. Now, almost everything is digitized instead. This has had insane impacts on lots of different industries, of course. Back in the 90s, if you had any communications at all, it was through an analog modem, dial-up usually. Uh, probably not more than 50 kilobits per second. Uh, that tra has transitioned to broadband, for now a lot of us have 100 megabits per second to our home. And then the other one was wireline to wireless. Back in the 90s, only a few people had cell phones. Now, essentially, everyone does, regardless of your age. Uh, these have been, I think, probably the four biggest ones, the ones I talk about the most. There, was, there were some others as well. But those were the big four. And the example I'd love to use is if I would take a, a photo of you guys and then want to send it to you all, or send it to any one of you. I just took it, I can click, uh, message you, I can email it to you electronically. And you think about that, I've replaced physical movement, taking a regular ca camera, putting it on analog film, taking it to the drugstore, getting it developed, picking it back up, putting it in the mail, and mailing it to you. Now, it's digital, I send it via telecommunications. It's not low bandwidth, that's like, what, 10 megapixels being sent? That's high bandwidth broadband and it's sending wirelessly. So this is one example has an example of those first four. And think about how much impact that's had. Think about Kodak as one example of an industry essentially that got totally changed. Similarly changes to every one of the industries including communications of course. So that as we'll talk about a little bit more detail later is kind of done or we're well in that phase. Now we have a new set of technologies that will be just as impactful as that old technology, set of technologies. And we're about in the same place we were in the 90s with these new ones. And again, I won't spend a lot of time talking about these because I have in the past. I want to get to AI. Uh, but we're basically, we're talking about humans not being completely replaced by machines, but machines doing things that humans used to do. And of course, I'm talking about here uh, robots of all different types, but I'm also talking about uh, drones and autonomous vehicles. We're going from people communicating and our communication systems being built for people to things communicating and our communication systems being more and more uh, built for uh, things communicating, therefore the uh, Internet of Things. Uh, we see standard computing, uh, the type that I've, we've all grown up with from actually, when, in my case, when computing was pretty young, to something very advanced, but now we're moving to artificial intelligence. Uh, which is much more uh, powerful uh, ways of uh, communicate, uh, uh, computing, but also cognitive computing, uh, where the computers act much more like humans. So the example I gave last year of Cognit, the, assist, uh, the little robot for uh, helping dementia patients uh, by looking at the dementia patients, seeing what is, what, whether he's taking his pills or not, who he's seen, uh, taking all sorts of sensors and input data, trying to figure out how to help the, uh, the, the patient with taking their pills or remembering people or staying on schedule. Uh, so also output. So we have input, output, and then a, uh, a, an intelligence uh, in, inside uh, all working together. And then the other one is, uh, of the, of the big ones, is screen-based interfaces with computers that we're used to 
to the AR, our augmented reality and virtual reality interfaces that we'll talk about uh, later this afternoon. Uh, this again is still in its baby step, baby phases, but I think we'll probably, don't know how it's going to turn out yet, but uh, we'll see some, some changes there too as a major transition. So these four alone would be, cause the same type of changes that we saw in the, in, starting in the 90s from in the last wave of innovation. And they're sort of uh, supported by the, 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 the other three that I think you're all pretty familiar with, the cloud computing, big data, and then more recently, uh, fast data, where we act on masses of data instantaneously to solve customers' problems, to detect fraud, et cetera. So let's talk about how fast these new technologies will be adopted. I have seen some forecasts, and I've shown in the past some forecasts of individual ones, but it's really the, the mass of these technologies together that are the most interesting. So by way of analogy, which is you guys that know me know I always think about analogies, we'll just look at the first wave of, the, of innovation and see how fast that was adopted. So if you look at uh, the wireless uh, generations, uh, cell phones came, came out in the 80s, but it wasn't really until the 90s that it started becoming a mass, uh, introduced on a, a mass scale. Most of us probably got our first cell phone in the 90s. And you can see that starting in the 90s, it slowly built up following a standard S-shaped curve till by 2015, we were at a point where it was equal population. And now in 2018, we're well, 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 well past that. And we've, of course, gone through several generations of technology to make all this happen. Uh, so starting in the, in the 90s, uh, hitting about 80 percent uh, within 15 years or so. And of course, as I mentioned, this has become not just people, but also uh, machines. We'll talk more about that later. Okay, let's talk about broadband. Uh, when I first, my first uh, laptop was uh, connected with a dial-up modem, so it was my second. But then we went digital and uh, broadband. And so if you go back to the late 90s, uh, we People first started getting uh, cable modems and, and DSL. And then by 2010, we were uh, up to about 65% of households. By 2015, we were uh, pushing 80, 75 to 80%. So again, over about 20 years, we reached sort of from the start to widespread adoption. Similarly, if you looked at HTTV, it came out around 2000 or so. Uh, by 2015, we were past 80% adoption. Of course, now we're on to the, the, the ultra high definition. So in every one of those cases, I mean, they're, everyone's a little bit different, but basically by and large, this last wave I talked about started in the late uh, mid 90s and by around where we are now in 2017, 2000, excuse me, 2018, we're about, so, about 75%. And that's just rough. And some technology were 100%, some were, were not there. But those major changes that we talked about occurred in about 20 years from where we are, where we were when we started till, till now. So by analogy, if we assume we were in about the same place we were in the mid-90s for these new technologies, kind of all of them put together, and if we were to follow the same rate of penetration of these technologies into industry and society, we would be at about the place we are with this, the first wave, somewhere around 2037 or about uh, 20 years from now. So probably in most of our lifetimes, most likely for many of us, well, within our careers, we will be living this transition that's likely to be as impactful as the transition we've lived through for the last 20 years, maybe even more so. So, uh, you know, this is very general, generalized speculative forecast, but what it's saying is we're going to be, from now on, in the takeoff phase and then the mass uh, adoption phase of some really interesting technologies that will have some really big impacts on industry. Now, one thing about AI that I've discovered just through observation is it seems to be very pervasive in that if it's built into one device, it also is interpreting inputs from other devices, sensors or, or other systems, and then it's also putting in outputs acting on things that could also affect other systems that have AI into it. Also, a lot of these things are always interacting with the cloud, picking out little things that involve AI. So if you think about that middle box as, say, a uh, home security system, 
Well, it may have sensors coming in from smart cameras and uh, motion detectors, uh, any number of input devices. It could be sending out signals to any number of uh, output devices. And it also is communicating through the cloud through any number of systems. All these which have AI in it. So AI gets embedded in a lot of different places. And so we probably shouldn't think of AI as being something in one box, but a system of different uh, systems. And also we shouldn't think about AI as being something that's sequestered into a box, but it's a, something that has ways of discovering the outside world, just like we do, and ways of acting on the outside world, just like we do, and ways of interacting with that cloud of knowledge out there, just like we do. Uh, so it's not necessarily how smart it is, but it can do a whole lot of things that, that, that people can do. I should point out here, because I I'll, I'll probably won't say it again, is that a lot of these things are AI, a lot of these things are clever, clever computing. It doesn't really matter. They look the same in terms of what they do. Okay, I would like to spend some time um, talking about uh, what I've discovered in terms of forecasting performance. And before I do that, I just wanted to go back and talk about some basics of forecasting performance. Uh, so the, the most common one is uh, Moore's Law. This is an old version, but the new ones are, are the same. Basically, if you plot uh, linearly over time the performance in, in some measure of a new technology, uh, it will plot as a straight line if you have a log scale, like shown over on the left. Or it'll plot as a hockey shape, it's a hockey stick shaped curve uh, if you plot it on, on a linear scale. And what this reflects is constant percentage rate of advance. So Moore's Law is about 42% improvement uh, uh, every, uh, every year or doubling every couple of years. Okay, so constant doubling, constant percentage improvement, that's characteristic of an exponential curve. So, and Moore's Law is just one of that. These types of curves are what we typically see in performance improvement. A straight line on semi-log or the classical uh, exponential shape uh, on linear. And there's some reasons for that that we don't have time to go into. Uh, and what we found is that, like I say, most new technology will, will, will progress this way, and the rate will continue as long as it's technically feasible, as long as it's economically valuable, in other words, the utility or demand is there for it, and as long as the basic approach remains the same. So if the, if the approach changes or some one of those other things changes, what you should look for is discontinuities or maybe changes in the improvement rate. But in general, we're looking for constant exponential improvement. Now, I mentioned some discontinuities or changes. So, for example, uh, if you were to plot the speeds of analog mo dial-up modems, the ones I used you know, early in my career, uh, and we used at home for years and years, uh, it followed a, uh, an exponential curve, very well, straight line. And then we introduced broadband. And there was some, some talk about broadband offering a whole new improvement rate. But all it really did was we popped up to about a megabit per second, or 1,500, uh, roughly 1,000 kilobits per second, uh, and started a new line that was exactly about the same speed as the old line, improving our typical broadband uh, data rates to where now, in the 2000s, we're at uh, past 100 megabits per second. So here's a case where we have two exponential curves with discontinuity just changed the, the, the spot. Uh, sometimes it changes the rate as well. So if you were to look at the old fiber optic systems, the single wavelength ones, they followed a very a nice exponential curve, a straight line, uh, until the uh, 90s. And then we introduced DWDM, Dense Wavelength Division Multiplex. What did that do? That added more light. At first it added just two channels, and then we added or wavelengths, and then we you had four wavelengths, and now we're up to hundreds of wavelengths. So by adding wavelengths in an exponential fashion, and along with making electronics faster in an exponential fashion, we came up with a new exponential curve that uh, was a straight line, but a faster straight line. So new technology approach, new thing. It was only temporary. What happened then? Well, around 2000, there was a burst in the market. It leveled off. And then since then, once the excess capacity of the manufacturing processes uh, got used up, it started on another line, but something closer to the, uh, the, the first one. So in this case, we had an increase in the rate, 
but it was temporary and probably you know, it would have hit the physical limits uh, anyway. So now let's look at AI. And how many people have looked at, had heard, had heard about Kurzweil, Ray Kurzweil, and his forecast regarding the singularity? Okay, I want to show one of his slides first. And the first thing I want to say is before I get to it, I don't endorse it. <laughs> and I'll tell you why in a second. This is the classic slide from his, his, his website. It shows a, if you look at the red dots of data, and he's, what we're doing is plotting computing power against, uh, we have calculations per second here. You, you see it's a log scale on the, on the left there. So uh, if it follows an exponential curve, it should be straight like that red line. So Larry Vanston would see that data, and I would plot that red line. And that would be exponential growth. What Kurzweil is saying is, no, 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 things are, not only is things improving exponentially, they're actually, we're going to put an exponent on the exponent. So, so not just raising it to a power, we're going to raise that power over time. And that gives what's called double exponential growth. Double exponential growth goes crazy, really, really fast. And that's what he's showing here uh, with a uh, white line is the Kurzweil forecast, which basically says that there'll be computing power equal to all human brains uh, within most of our lifetimes. But he gets there by assuming this double exponential. If you don't assume that, it's going to be much more like 2100 uh, in the next century before you reach that. So in terms of your conclusion, it matters a lot what forecast you use. I have never seen a double exponential in my life that lasted very long. And what they base the argument on is uh, that not only that the rate of improvement as we go from one technology to another has changed, but if you really look at the data and you adjust for maybe the Great Depression and World War II, uh, what could be a curve that, that changes and looks like an exponential on an exponential plot uh, could also just be a straight line. There's really little evidence for why you would put together technologies as different, you know, starting with electromechanical to uh, integrated circuits, uh, and assume that those would together form a double exponential. It's just, the evidence is just not there. Now, a little bit of math for you, for uh, those of you who love math. The most common way to write an exponential is with the uh, E, you know, 2.78, the constant, raised to the B, which is some uh, slope. Uh, uh, times t. So it's basically t is in the exponent. If two things are working together to improve, so for example, computing pro processing is getting faster, but engineering talent is getting faster as well. Uh, if you put those two things together, the overall rate of improvement is what we call multiple exponentials, where the two you multiply the two exponentials together. And if you, if you do that, you get another exponential, just the math of that works. And that happens quite a bit. That was, was happening when we got the super fast acceleration with the, the fiber optics. When we went from single mode to multi-mode, we had the electronics improving exponentially. We had the number of uh, spec uh, wavelengths we're using improving exponentially. Put them together. We still have exponential, it's just faster. So two exponentials together make something faster. What the double exponential is, is where you put uh, the uh, the, the uh, x on, in, the ex, uh, in the exponent. And so that's mathematically totally different. That really doesn't happen. So my proposal is that, oh, here's the example of two exponentials on a straight, a straight lines, one and two, multiply them together, you get the green line there. It's all an exponential. The double exponential starting at the same rate would be the black line there. And you can see how fast it goes high. So, I had this little video clip that's kind of fun. I figured I'd do the mouse. Basically, what he's saying is uh, he says some other important things, but he's basically saying that between computational speed and uh, uh, engineering improvement, we're on a double exponential in terms of AI. And of course, Musk is one of the people that are very concerned about AI. I think the way he described it, when he said double exponential, he wasn't talking about the real double in exponential. He was talking about two exponentials multiplied together. The key thing is, it doesn't, in some sense, it, it's, it's still important. Exponential is exponential, and exponential is still fast. It's just probably not as fast as everybody is worried about. And then he goes on to uh, mention Go, which I'll talk about in a second, uh, the game there, and then also about what he thinks that there probably is time to start thinking about uh, from a, on a government level, starting st studying AI and, and its implications. So anyway, Kurzweil means a true double exponential. Must, must thinks, I think, really means multiple exponential. 
let's assume that exponential is the right thing to look at in terms of AI progress. And your assumption is, pretty, is right. Um, there is, however, a catch to, to that assumption, and I'll explain it to you in a minute. It basically depends, it's a distinction between easy problems and hard problems. An easy problem, the computations grow linearly, or at least uh, polynomially, with the size of the problem. So, for example, if you're mowing a lawn, or I have to use a different example, if I'm searching for a drop coin between uh, this line and where John's standing. I don't know where it is, but I've got to search it all. And I start walking. The difficulty of that problem is basically linear with the distance, right? Because uh, so, and, but, so, but on the other hand, if the, uh, the coin is somewhere in this room and I can only walk in a straight line back and forth, the difficulty of the problem is the square of the distance between me and that camera. So it goes up, difficulty goes up as a, as a square. And if it happened to be the whole room and it was a cube, it would go up a, as a cube. So the difficulty in this case is the exponent k of the largest uh, factor in the polynomial. But let's, let's say for the time being it's linear. Anyway, problems that grow linearly or exponentially are easy problems, actually, for us or for a computer. Uh, because the problem size gets bigger, the, the, the difficulty gets uh, difficult in proportion. Hard problems grow exponentially uh, as a, with, within. A lot of problems are hard. A lot of problems uh, basically involve a decision trees where you have a number of levels it go to. So if you think about a simple game, you might have five moves in that game, the first move. If you go to the second move, there are five other, for each of those five alternatives, there are five more alternatives, so you have 25 possibilities. If you go another level, another move forward, you would have three, so you go to 125. So by the 10th move, you're up to 10 million uh, possibilities to look at. By the 20th move, you're up to almost 100, what, trillion or quadrillion or something. And so by the time you get 25 moves in advance, you get beyond capabilities, and then soon you'll be at the number of stars and how long the universe is and so forth. Uh, so these numbers get very big. So difficulty gets as high as the number n gets big. A lot of common problems, including game playing, but lots of other problems as well, uh, language interpretation, for example, are basically multi-dimensional problems that, have, that are like this and are therefore hard. In fact, every time you add a dimension, you make it, it basically adds, multiplies again. So we're definitely on uh, exponential type growth in terms of uh, difficulty. So what does that mean? Well, suppose you have an exponential increase in processing speed, an exponential increase in performance, uh, in efficiency, and you were to put all that together, say in thinking about solving a problem. So our computers are getting faster, that's the first one. And then also our, our, our talent in mathematics, for example, or analysis is also improving exponentially. We're putting more scientists on the problems, better mathematicians, better computer scientists. And so combine those together, like Musk was saying, uh, you get the combined form that is fast, but it's still an exponential, okay? So we're getting better exponentially. Uh, the combined performance is at E raised to BT. Now, for a given solution time, if we take the, the F of N, which is the computation or difficulty, number of computations it takes to solve problem size N, divide it by the performance rate, in other words, the, the, uh, computations per, per second, uh, you'll get how long it takes to solve a problem of size uh, n uh, at time t. So if you think about n being the, 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 the performance of the, 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 of, the, of the AI program, it turns out that the maximum problem size you can solve in a given amount of time, n, uh, increases exponentially if fn is a uh, polynomial, uh, so that means we can solve f problems faster in exponential fashion uh, if it's an easy problem. It only improves linearly if it's a hard problem. So think about this. Our performance will go up linearly instead of exponentially on hard problems. Give, that's even with exponential increase in engineering and exponential increase in computer power. 
That's the math for it. So hard problems, we expect a straight line uh, on a standard scale, easy problems, exponential. So let's look at some examples. Uh, chess, that's on a uh, linear scale. It looks pretty straight line to me. There was a discontinuity due to, to, to hardware. Go is a very interesting one. There was a lot of progress in, in Go up until before uh, AlphaGo came along, but you can see it's pretty much linear. Uh, this was using basically Monte Carlo tree searches. With AlphaGo, they did essentially three things. They, or well, four things really. They switched to deep learning, or they added deep learning, which is uh, uh, improved technology. They added uh, more computer hardware. They added parallel processing, and they added a whole team of scientists to tackle the problem. So they did make a, uh, a, a big leap, but as uh, Brundage has observed, it really doesn't represent that much of a surprise given this sort of discontinuity step change they made. And since then, uh, progress has been pretty much linear again. So it goes a classical hard tree problem. It just is hard. Image recognition, again, um, that's the linear scale has been pretty much linear in terms of uh, here's the error rate uh, instead of uh, ELO scores or DAN scores. Uh, another image rec uh, rec uh, resolution recognition. Uh, speech recognition. You remember the early speech recognition days at the uh, kiosk or, or reading? Uh, they made some progress. But the red line, you know, true conversational speech, for example, made some linear progress through 2000 and flat line. No progress for a long time. And then when the uh, deep neural networks came out in around 2011, again, they made some discontinuous process. But since then, since 2011, with the new technology, again, it's been straight line. So again, linear improvement. Uh, machine translation, by the way, the red dotted line is human level. Again, could be some exponential there, but it looks pretty linear also, using the blue scores. Uh, SAT tests, you know, computer takes SAT tests, like, like you guys probably did at one time. Uh, again, uh, pretty much linear improvement. Uh, generating computer programs, uh, kind of two points, it's kind of hard to tell whether it's linear or exponential, but we're a long way from, uh, uh, from human accuracy. So that's just a handful of problems out there that are reasonably tractable for which we have data. They all tend to be linear for most cases with discontinuities. So we still have a wide range of program difficult, problem difficulty. We have a wide range of where we are now and how far we have to go to, to reach human process. We have different metrics for each one, uh, the different progress rates, different patterns, but we're, they do tend to be linear, which I think is reflective of the principle that computing power is going up exponentially. We may be getting better at doing AI exponentially, but the progress is typically linear. So some other thoughts on AI before I, um, I, I wrap up. Um, we don't really, I don't think, have that good understanding about given a, a given new problem which category, whether easy, it's easy or hard, or how fast we can overcome the difficulties, or what level you have to reach to become human or superhuman. Uh, I don't think there's really a science for that yet, but it's a very interesting part of this. For those of you that think about general intelligence and when will computers be as smart as us, um, it's an interesting point to think about, and I'm not gonna talk any more about it, but do the problems really get harder as we go toward superintelligence, or do they get easier when we go from really smart to human intelligence? If you think about evolution, it took a whole long time to get to you know, basic intelligence that a, that a lizard has, and then to a, to a dog, for example. Is going from a dog to a human that biggest step, or is that the easy part? We don't really know. I mean, we think we do. We think that's really hard, but it might not be. Uh, and how will AI systems play with each other? When you have AI systems better than everything, we may feel good about one AI system, but we, do we really know how they interact together? Are they going to gang up on us? I don't know. And how will they interact with the outside world? Will some bug you know, send the, the Uber car without a driver to me, open the door, I get in, close the door behind me, locks it, and takes me somewhere I don't want to go and holds me for ransom? I don't know, but it's something to think about. And then people argue about AI bootstrapping itself so that the, the 
robots will basically reinvent themselves even better and we'll get in some spiral that basically leaves humans behind. Another performance issue that's interesting, but I'm not going to talk about it anymore. It's just out there and interesting. So what does all this mean for uh, commerce and industry, communications, you know, your business and uh, mankind? <clears throat> we can talk about that a lot offline. For commerce and industry, it's amazing how widespread this is. It's across all different industries, uh, all different applications with industries. It involves uh, processes, products, and services. So it's not just going to be in our, in our doodahs, but it's also going to be in our tax systems and uh, in going to a restaurant, lots of different things. And it's also embe embedded in all these transformative technologies that I talked about at first. All the robotics, all the drones, all the autonomous vehicles, all the cognitive computing systems. Uh, it's going to be part and parcel of all the Internet of Things. Uh, certainly, it's going to be some big impacts or tie-ins with VR and AR. Not that we know what they're going to be, uh, but it's all tied in together. So it's going to be extremely interesting. Lots of opportunities, but also some huge disruptions. So if you look at the business press for the last year or so, they talk about all the AI and all the opportunities and all the disruptions. It's very much drawn a lot of attention. How much of it's hype and how much reality, don't know yet, but some of it's going to stick. And of course, we talk about a lot the employment implications of all this. Uh, and there are, of course, huge positives and negatives for what will happen there. Uh, for, commu for communications, I think what we're going to see is the same thing we've seen in the last 20 years. Rapid uh, requirements for performance improvement, rapidly improving technologies, Lots more investment uh, on a large scale, much more upgrades, rapid obsolescence, and then added to that some changes in the workforce as well that we'll have to deal with. So it'll we'll keep you guys busy. It'll have a lot of impact on your uh, current investment. <coughs> for the implications for mankind, I don't even know how to get started on this one. Uh, there are obviously lots of opportunities for good and evil and lots of, uh, lots of opinions about those things. They did a poll of some, I think, some 800 uh, writers on, uh, on AI. And this is sort of a, a heat chart of their feelings of uh, uh, being extremely uh, op optimistic for mankind and pessimistic. So the yellow is optimistic. The black down here in the corner is uh, pessimistic. And the, the blue kind of is in between. So lots of varying opinions there. There are some existential stress. Some of them are real. Some of them are imagined. In some senses, they're probably farther away than Kurzweil thinks. On the other hand, there are some possibilities for not human-like intelligence, but lots of interactions between subhuman intelligence that could go wrong that are probably things we should be worrying about now in terms of existential threats. And then there are huge challenges, political, uh, economic, social, especially regarding the changes in our, in, in our work lives. You know, that we have gone through revolutions before in technology that impacted employment. Uh, we're living through one right now. Uh, we do get by them. There, we adjust to them. But often there are some revolutions and wars and bad things that happen in between. So I, I'm not so uh, flippant about saying, oh, it's all take care of itself. We always, you know, provide, make new jobs and replace the old ones. It's not that simple. It's going to be hard. And it's going to need to be managed. That's going to require political maturity, and then from politicians, a lot of economic maturity from from business, and uh, some social thinking as well. And the thing I keep coming across when I talk about people in this in Austin is it's really up to us. We're in a position, <laughs> unique in history, about having some influence. And as basically being the elite, uh, we have as much influence about on what's going to happen as anybody else does.